Major support for these broadcasts is provided by New York Community Bank, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chelsea Lighting, Capital One Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, Genova Burns, Gian Tomasi and Webster, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, The Wickhoff Group, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, m and Bank. Additional support is provided by Ackman Ziff Real Estate Group, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Briarwood Organization, Bruce Mosler, C.B. Richard Ellis, Colliers International, New York, LLC, Cushman and Wakefield, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, DDG Partners, Friedman LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Flushing Bank, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, Madison Realty Capital, Margolin Weiner and Evans LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Massey Knackle Realty Services, New Banks, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Sterling and Sterling, SJP Properties, Stonehenge Partners, and these friends. There's only one Lloyd Price, and there couldn't be another one. And I'm so happy to continue my conversation on the life of Lloyd Price. Thanks for being here, Lloyd. Thank you, Mike. So, Lloyd, you know, what is this? We got Lottie Miss Clotty, we got a book, we got a newly released uh, CD. But let's, let's continue. You know, everybody knows you from Lottie Miss Clotty, which I did find on iHeart this week, and I listened to that. And then, then there was Stagger Lee, right? Uh, that's right. Okay, so give me some of the lyrics of Stagger Lee. Well, about. there was one in between Stagger Lee. And what was that? And Lord and Miss Claudia. Just Because. So what was that? How did you, you decide to do Just Because? Well, I got drafted in the Army, Mike, and when I came out to service, see, I started this big beat business with Lord and Miss Claudia. Lord and Miss Claudia was the first record that teenagers, both black and white, bought, and this kind of start the, the big beat rolling. When I got drafted in the Army from being so popular for integrating the South and wherever, I, well, America needed integration at that time, and this music integrated most of the skating rings in America. So by me being so popular, they drafted me in the Army thinking that would stop the big beat. When I got out, the beat just kept rolling. You, you know, since you brought up the Army, Mm -hmm. Can we talk about the time that you went AWOL? Yes, you could, because... I think it's a good little story. It right? is. It is. I just didn't think that... Uh, I had five brothers in that service. And back in the day when, in the Korean War conflict, the military should have only taken four from a family. My fifth brother had to volunteer for the Coast Guard. He could not go in armed service. But when Lord and Miss Cardi hit, and all these kids now want to dance to this music, the draft board called me in and told me that um, the chairman of the Armed Service Committee wants you in the Army. And I couldn't understand that, of course, because I already had five brothers in the service. But they took me anyway and sent me on over to... Uh, to Korea, and uh, the beat kept going. So when the beat kept going, the independent record companies had to find a Lloyd Price or a Lord and Miss Claudia. Before that period, what happened was the big companies only recorded great singers, you know, Ben Crosby, Nat Cole, 
and those are like these people who had uh, star quality in Hollywood. That was the recording artist for the big companies. There was only a couple of big companies, RCA, and there was, uh, of course, DECA, and of course, there was, well, there was Mercury, and the, the capital, of course, was an English company. So it was very, 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 very close. When Nat Cole recorded with Strings, that was huge, you know, coming from a Nat Cole trio. So a lot of Miss Claudia changed the sound of music and changed the buying pattern of music in America. And that's what, it's, that's what happened. When I got out of service, everybody was into that beat. So I made a couple of records with that same beat, and it didn't happen. So one day I was on my way home, and I heard an opera, and I think it was called Karen Omin. I mean, it was Rigoletto, and there was a song in there called Karen Omin, and, and the melody was la di da di da 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 And? And it sounded like a musical scale. And I said, just because you left and said goodbye. And that was my first big record out of the service. And then came Stagger Lee. Stagger Lee was a play I written while in Korea in special service entertaining the troops. I needed something to entertain the field grade officers, the generals, and I got tired of doing tea for two and apple, you know, and uh, cherry pink and apple blossom white, fly me to the moon, things like that. So I wanted to write something different to really entertain the 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 general and the officers. Now the problem on that later on was with Dick Clark on American Bandstand said you had to change the lyrics, right? He was a little upset. That's right, but it never was intended to be a record. It was a B-side. It was a B-side. The hit, I thought, was a song you call You Need Love. You need love. And, and then how? Johnny, you're too young. But I'm going to get married. You're too young. My name she'll carry. So that was a very important song. Yeah, again, it was earmarked for the teenagers. And why I wrote that song is because every June when kids would graduate, most of them would get married, and their parents would tell them, you're too young and they insisted on getting married because uh, being in love and whatever other reasons they had. But let me finish tell you about Stagger Lee. Stagger Lee was the B-side, and the top of it, the night was clear and the moon was yellow and the leaves came tumbling down. I had soldiers acting that out on the stage, and it, was, it went over really, really good in Korea, but I never thought it would be a hit record. Uh, when I came and did You Did Love for ABC Paramount, Don Costa asked me, did I have a B-side? And I got on the piano and played Stagger Lee. Did one take. Now, when we were talking, when we got together a couple weeks ago, we, we said that one of the, the revolutionary things you did is that you opened up your own um, record store, not a record store, a the, the nightclub, the nightclub, no, the, in New York, the turntable. How'd that happen? Well, that was way later. I know, but where I'm trying to get... Why it happened, Mike, is because I, as an artist, figured out a long time ago that there got to be some other place for us to work in New York other than the Apollo Theater. Because you go to the Apollo and you're doing 35 shows a week for... $2,000, $2,500, $3,000. And doing one night is on the road, you're getting five and $7,000 a night. It just did not make sense economically. So I said, well, you know what? When, the, when, when I found out that Birdland was going to be closed, I rushed down to the real estate office and got a lease on the place, completely stripped it, redone it, and made it Lloyd Price's turntable. That 52nd Street and Broadway, to get to rhythm and blues artists downtown across 110th Street because the Basin Street East, the Copacabana, the Raw Box at the Americana, or the Palladium, none of these clubs would work R&B artists. They would tell you you need to have a nightclub act. Well, hell, you're selling millions of records. Why, why can't you just go in there and be yourself? So that's one of the reasons why I opened the club on Broadway. Now, be, besides you performing there, who else was performing? Well, when I had James Brown in, <laughs> we tied up traffic on Broadway, the same as he did up on 8th Avenue and, and, and 125th Street. 
the coaches, Maxine Brown, King Curtis, uh, 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 Johnny Nash, uh, Chubby Checker. What about your buddy uh, Benny King? Well, Benny, Benny never worked the turntable. Uh, Benny came a little later in, on in the 60s. You know, and Benny was with the Drifters when uh, Clyde McFadder and Charlie uh, Whitehead. Uh, Benny was a lead singer. When his, his, his time came when these guys decided to go as individual artists. And Fats, who, who worked with you on your first song? Fats Domino played piano on my first five records. And Fats was, knew so much about my music. When I went in the Army, he became Fats Domino with 19 number one singles mm -hmm. from that same beat of Lord and Miss Claudia. Let's talk about, you know, you moved to Africa. Talk to me about what you did in Africa. Well, why, let me tell you why I went to Africa. Because when I opened the club on Broadway, we was doing so much business and changing, this, changing the whole scene downtown. Uh, I was going to be the first rock artist, first black rock artist with a television show. Larry Spangler, the guy that produced the Merv Griffin show, he's, I wrote a song for him. He came out with a, with a film with, with Fred Williamson, his first big film called Nigger Charlie. And I wrote the theme song to that film. And Larry Spangler was so impressed with me, they had a meeting about why should they change that title? You know? <laughs> I said, why would you change the title? Say, well, nigga Charlie, you know, in Cleveland may not play well. I said, nigga Charlie don't play well nowhere. So why don't you keep the title nigga Charlie? Because could you imagine uh, white people in Mississippi see a big black guy like Fred Williamson knocking out some white guy? Could you imagine the black people would go see that? So leave the title to what it was. <laughs> so, so you have this with yeah, uh, Charles Charles uh, LeBlanc, I think his name was was the president of Paramount Pictures, and he, he agreed with me so much until they decided I should do my own TV show from my club in New York, being the first teenage idol to sell a million records, first black guy. I was so many firsts, and they figured I should have a TV show coming from my nightclub in New York. The night we had the press conference, you couldn't get in. They told me that, Lloyd, tomorrow, your face gonna be in 17 associated press papers around the world, having the first black nightclub on Broadway, first black TV show. That morning, after the press conference, somebody sneaked in the office and killed my partner. That's why I went to Africa. <laughs> so, so you got to, uh, now you spent, no, you, no, in Africa was an interesting, you, one of the major things that you did in Africa is that you had met early in your life this, this guy who really ran a bar uh, by the name of, um, what was his name? Your, your oh, buddy. Don King? Don King. I, you oh, know. Don. Yeah, Don was my very right. good friend. Your friend Don King, who at that time was not a promoter, but you were in Africa at this time. Well, yeah. Well, Don Don used to tell me all the time when he came out of school, you know, man, make me big. Make me big. I don't ever want to go back to jail. Never, never, never. So I introduced him to Muhammad Ali on his daughter's fifth birthday. And I had, at that time, he was Cassius Clay. I had him to sing happy birthday to her. And Don said, man, let me talk to the champ. Let me talk to the champ. So he got out on the phone and talked with Ali. And then he decided this is what he wanted to do. You know, Don was very big out in Cleveland with numbers. And he had a nightclub. I made him build a club as big as a Copa for me in Cleveland at 7, 8, and Cedar to put my band in. Well, I didn't make him do it. I said, the only way you want me to, you want me to work your club, you got to give me something to work in. Now, how did you and he come out with the idea to go to this fledging uh, Time Warner Amex uh, company to do pay-per-view on the, the fight? Well, actually, it wasn't Time Warner. It was a company called uh, Video Techniques. Right, which was subsequently yeah, acquired by Time Warner. at that time, Warner. it was pay-for-view. It was pay-for-view. And uh, we couldn't get no money here in America. You know, we couldn't get nobody to give these two guys $5 million apiece. The most money any athlete well, let me give you an example. Mickey Mantle, I think, was making 110, 10,000 a year. Willie Mays was getting 80,000. We giving two black guys five million a piece. Could you imagine what that sound like? G going to sounds like the movie. 
<laughs> Could have had the same thing. <laughs> so we couldn't find no money, but uh, what happened, John Daly, with Hemdale Leisure Corporation, he produced the uh, uh, the platoons, the, the last the last emperor, had a lot of big films. Well, at that time, he he put up a million and a half dollars for the ancillary rights for the for the for the for the fight, and Don was in Paris trying to find some people to invest money. He saw a black guy walking somewhere on around the Saint Elysees, and he thought it was somebody he knew from Cleveland. The guy's name was Manduga Bula. He was an advisor to Mobutu. Spoke seven different languages. When Don walked up to him and said, "Hey, brother," he started speaking in German. <laughs> so. Don told him that what he needed, but Mobutu needed something at the same time. Mobutu had just changed the Belgium Congo to Zaire. He needed to get that name uh, ahead of, of, uh, of what he had done. And of course, Patricia Lumumbo had just got killed down there. There's a lot of problems going on in the Belgium Congo. Well, this was a good PR for them. It was great PR. Don told him, we'll bring you 6,000 people down here and we'll do this, and we'll get the, all the press in the world to come see this fight with George Foreman and Mama Ali. 45 minutes, and Mobutu put up the money for the fight. 1980, you come back. You come back to do what? I mean, I know you, you, you <clears> did, <throat> you came back, part of it was Mayor Koch was doing some, renov helping the city grow, but you built 42, uh, what, three family homes? Up in Harlem at uh, 184th and Valentine. I built 60 out in uh, Staten Island. But that was part of the things I was doing. While I came back, our government was overthrown. The soldiers came back and decided to take the country back again. So we had to find something to do. And most of the government officials was here with me. And uh, by me being a, 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 a businessman here in New York, I found out that the New York Partnership was looking for developers. So I put together Lloyd Price Developing Company, and... And you built in Staten Island and up in Harlem. Uh, yes. Now, with regard to Lloyd Price being the entrepreneur, how do you come out with a lot of Miss Claudia, you know, the, the cookies and the, the sweet potato? How, how do you decide to go into the food business? Well, there's a food... I, I know Mom had the <laughs> restaurant, you know, <laughs> so you, you had the roots over there, but, you, you know, you, you didn't open up the... Uh, uh, the Lloyd Price barbecue restaurant, but you, you went into the good natural foods and you went in there. How did you decide to go into that business? Well, going into the food business was one of my life's dreams. When Muhammad Ali was the biggest, biggest uh, icon in the world, I went to a company called Iowa Beef to get Ali to, I was going to use a logo called Champ's Chicken. And I wanted Iowa Beef to, 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 to private labor that stuff, and they, and they were going to do it. Uh, Frank Perdue was selling 263 million pounds of chicken a year in Harlem. So I figured if I got Ali's name, Jim Brown's name, Al Thier's name, every six months I'd change my You don't name. think if he had Mike Stoller's name? Mike Stoller would work. Uh, okay. Cousin Ali was Stoller. Right, okay. <laughs> so Champ Chicken would work. And we would get sell 100 million pounds of that chicken and just snatch a little piece of that Purdue's business out of Harlem. I was only thinking Harlem. But then they wanted to expand the idea to do it all over the world. Sell prayer rugs, sell beads, and do everywhere. Well, it took about 10, 13 months for the, uh, out in, uh, for Chicago to agree and all these lawyers. So it was taking too much time and our beef decided not to do it. 35 years later, here is Walmart. And I said, well, you know what? I go in Walmart, look at the shelves. I see Aunt Jemima, which is not a black product. I see Uncle Ben's, which is not a black product. I see cream of wheat, which is not a black product. So the question in the paper was, why isn't there a general food, uh, uh, African-American general food company in America? And that's why you see this. It's more than sweet potato product. That's only one of the items. No, but that was one of the, the items. And then the cookies were another. The, cook, the cookies, that's it. Because in these big stores, you have to have a niche. 80% of all shelf space in America is controlled by four companies. So if you don't have something special to give Walmart, Walmart got 72,000 vendors, do nearly 3 billion transactions a day. You must have something to get shelf space. And I went to Bentonville 
and showed them this package. And he said, what is it? I said, a sweet potato cookie. In five minutes, he says, well, you have space. That's great. So, <laughs> so, a number of years ago, you wrote this book, The Sliding Miss Cloudy, The True Kings of the 50s, The Lloyd Price Story. People don't realize, I mean, you know, 1998 is the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, but you have uh, other places that you've also. Let's talk about some of the other places. The S National Sports? Uh... Yeah, National Sports and Entertainment, that's a, that's a Hall of Fame here in New York. How'd that happen? Um, and, well, um, well, I was, they found out that I was, I was worthy of being in that Hall of Fame. Yeah, now, what, what's very interesting, you know, some people have the Super Bowl ring. You happen to have your uh, 300 bowling ring, right? That's a perfect game. United Bowling Congress. I have six of them. But while well, I've been bowling all my life, is why? Because it's an indoor sport, and I work at night, and most of the time bowling alleys would be open all night long. So when I finished doing a show, I would go bowling. I don't drink or smoke. So that was my activity. Now, how did you get into bowling originally? You, you were a pin, pin boy. Pin, you were a pin boy, right? Nine years old, I was a pin boy, and been working ever since. Now, the, uh, the Rhythm and Blues. Rhythm oh. and Blues Foundation. Yeah, I'm in that, yeah. And I'm in uh, the South Carolina Hall of Fame. I'm in, uh, in now, Sweden. There's, there's, gold. There's, there's a great picture over here. Uh, you got an honorary doctorate in number Oh, yes, my ago? doctorate from... Uh, Southern University. <laughs> right. So now, in the, in the 90s, you went back, you, you toured with Huey Lewis, you did a couple of things. Let's talk about some of those, uh, you know, the revival of the music career. Yeah, well, Huey, Huey Lewis is a real good friend of mine. He and Bob Brown, Bob is his manager. Dear, dear friends. And I love the music. And a lot of folks that hear sound are like, like my music back during the day when I was doing it. But... Uh, I decided to go back to do music because there's an open hole to do great music. People have not forgot standards. Uh, when you listen to some of the music today, 80% of it are using the same tracks. You know, the electric, blah, 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 and there's an artist get on top of it and start rapping. But I think people want to hear melodies and they want to hear a, a nice big, big band sound, musical sound, because 10,000 uh, uh, baby boomers every day turn 65. So there's millions of them who relates to Eptide, uh, uh, F Fly Me to the Moon, uh, There Goes That Song Again, <laughs> and of course one of Carol King's great songs, Will You Love Me Tomorrow? Let's talk about, you know, the, the amount of times and the and the artists who have re-recorded Stagger Lee and Personality, those are the two major <clears throat> ones. But in addition to that, there are all these companies who have utilized the, the, the music from Personality. Tell me about that. Oh, personality has been rec recorded in 17 different languages. It's been recorded 178 times. General Motors, Howard Johnson, Fiat. I can't name the companies. Now, what do they do with the personality music? What is Well, the they sometimes change the lyrics. The important thing is keep the melody in the hook. You might say, Mike Stuller got personality. They change it. Howard Johnson has personality. General Motors got a new car, got personality. And that's why it's been used so much. Sagal Lee been recorded 268 times. Lord of Miss Claudia 169 times by the biggest rock artist in the world, starting with Elvis Presley, the Beatles, John Lennon, uh, Paul McCartney. They all recorded it singly. Fats Domino, Richard, James Brown. I could not name all of them who's done it. Now, what about, I think, I'm not sure when it was, you did something with Alan Freed's son? Alan Freed, yeah, Lance Freed. Lance Freed is the president and CEO of Rondo Irving Music, which is Herb Apple, Herb Apple and Jerry Moss. They are the administrators of my publishing, my songs around the world. Yes, and Lance Freed, Lance, Freed, Lance Freed is a real good guy. So let, let's talk about, uh, you know, since you're still a kid, talk to me <laughs> about, the, you know, the book you wrote. Let's talk about the, the play. 
Would you tell me about what you want to do with the play, you, Phil Ramone, and all the rest on which I know will be a great success. Well, Mike, the 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 the, the Lord of Miss Claudia, the musical, is telling a story. Most of what I just told you, it's about a young kid. See, the real key is. I have to be the one to tell the initial story <laughs> yeah. you know, over there. But no, okay, so it's a young kid, right? Seven years old, he started dancing. And uh, actually, I'm going to tell you, the, big, the first song I ever heard in my life, I was sweeping this place they call a juke. You know, in the South, there was a, had one big building, had a side for the white, a side for the black. Right, but you get the quarter. Right? Yeah, you I was sweeping every two, Monday. You got the quarters. That's right. right, if I swore both... Both sides, I got, got four, bit. four bits, right? <laughs> yeah. right. And, and, uh, and he had the spittoons, too, right? That's right, that's right. And the first song I ever heard that, that really got my attention, it was the nigger and the white man playing five up. The nigger beat the white man, scared to pick it up. You got to bottle up and go, bottle up and go. By a guy called Johnny Cunningham. With a guitar, there was no melody. You know, it was no timing, no meter, nothing. He only alone. He was back there with Bessie Smith and, you know, back during that time. So you want to go back to the time when you're seven? I wanted to get in that jukebox because I heard that music coming out of that box. And I said, oh, man. From seven years old, I had the imagination that one day I would be on a jukebox. But you told me the jukebox, which was in your mother's place, right? Yeah, well. It didn't have too many songs, right? No. Well, when I was like 13, 14 years old, my mother had a sandwich shop where she sold fish sandwiches on the weekend and had a 10 records on the box. I knew both sides of the record. I would sing it, get out on the floor and dance. They'd throw nickels and dime out there. And Louis Jordan was the king of the jukebox during that time. And I would sing all of his numbers. I knew them all. Of course, Charles Brown, Amos Milburn. I knew all those songs. And they would just keep playing those 10 songs. And I would dance until she closed that night. So let's talk. Children, you have any, uh, how many kids do you have? I have three daughters and two sons. What are they doing today? Well, uh, they are married, and three of them live in Atlanta, one live in Baltimore, and one lives in Detroit. And how many grandkids you got over there? I have 11 grandkids. 11 grandkids. Yes. And, and you keep being active over there with... Uh, How's this doing? This is on Amazon right now? That's on Amazon, and that's on Lloyd Price Music. Amazon.com and LloydPriceMusic.com. Okay. Go up, and you can hear, get a thrill. For, for <laughs> hey, you, you know it's better. You know, it's, what, what's really been the good thing of Pandora, iHeart, I and, you know, Spotify, is that people can go in and put the word the same way I did this weekend to make sure that I could hear some Lloyd Price music was put in Lloyd Price, and you can hear some of the original Lloyd Price songs. That's and, right. You know, and it's a great situation. And I'm really happy that uh, I've had the opportunity to spend a lot of time with Lloyd Price, and I hope that uh, uh, the, the show comes out. And I'll be there, and uh, we'll do more songs together. We've been looking for you, Mike, and you got to sing Johnny, you're too young. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for being here today.